We turn now to Connecticut Democratic Senator Chris Murphy. He was a top negotiator on the immigration deal that collapsed last week. The Senate is now focused on trying to pass aid to Israel and Ukraine. Uh, Senator, good to have you here. Yeah. Um, I want to get to the border later. I want to talk about the pieces you're trying to pick up here with this, uh, what, $95 billion emergency spending bill. Do you have any sense yet if there are 60 votes to pass all of this aid? I think we're going to pass this spending bill for Ukraine. We have already moved past several procedural hurdles that require 60 votes. I think there will be 60 votes in the end, and there has to be. On many days, Ukraine is firing one quarter of the artillery shells that Russia is. Some days they are only interrupting half the missiles that are being sent at Ukrainian cities. We are on the precipice of a disaster for Ukraine and for the world. Nikki Haley is right. Putin has made it clear mm -hmm. that if he wins Ukraine, he is going to continue on ultimately to a country that's going to get the United States directly involved in a confrontation with Russia. So it has been hard to get Republican votes to support Ukraine, made very difficult by Donald Trump's uh, opposition to Ukraine funding. Mm -hmm. But I think we're going to get this done in the Senate by early to mid next week. So on the border, the president has said the border's not secure. You were working to try to pass this legislation. In the absence of that, should he take executive action, and if so, what? Well, I think there's limited executive actions the president can take. He does not have the legal authority to shut down the border. Our bill, our bipartisan bill, would have given him that authority. If crossings were too high on a daily basis, the president could shut down portions of the border. The asylum system is broken. He can't fix that by executive order. It takes 10 years for people mm -hmm. to get an asylum claim processed. Many of them don't have legitimate claims. Only legislation can fix that. Our bill would have done that yeah. as soon as Republicans realized that it was actually going to fix the border. They voted against it en masse because they want the border to remain chaotic because it helps President Trump in his reelection efforts. We have more in depth to talk about on this issue. I have to take a break. Please stay here with us, Senator. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We continue our conversation now with Connecticut Democratic Senator Chris Murphy. Um, you are optimistic that this massive security supplemental will pass this week, but there is pressure uh, within your party to add some strings on when it comes to Israel aid. Um, why is it that the White House appears to be so powerless to rein in Benjamin Netanyahu when they are clearly uncomfortable with how he's waging this war? Well, I think we saw an important development last week. The White House released a letter in which they made clear that if we approve new aid to Israel, they are going to make sure that it is used in compliance with U.S. and international human rights law. And I think that's incredibly important. Right now, the level of civilian casualty inside Gaza is unacceptable. And it does not accrue to the national security goals of the United States, nor Israel, because it is going to essentially keep Hamas in business inside Gaza and around the region as they use this grievance structure as a means to continue to recruit. So I do think that that clarification will be important. I think the president's willingness to speak up a little bit more strongly about the way in which this campaign is being conducted will likely have a change in the operational pace. And I think it's incredibly important for the United States and for Israel for Hamas to be defeated, but for there to be a dramatic reduction in the number of civilians that are being killed. To your point, um, the White House sent a group of officials out to Michigan to meet with Arab Americans there who are very upset with um, with how the president has communicated specifically. CBS has a recording of one of the conversations the deputy national security advisor had. He said, I do not have any confidence in the current government of Israel. He also said the administration has left a, quote, very damaging impression as to how much the president values the lives of Palestinians. Should there be more strings attached to this aid package you're about to vote on? So the president does believe deeply in the importance of preserving life inside Gaza and has continually pressed for more humanitarian aid to get into Gaza. There would not nearly be the number of shipments coming in today if this president wasn't pushing hard for change. Um, but yes, there are many of us who believe that it is very important for us to make clear with this aid package that if Israel is going to use these dollars to perpetuate this campaign inside Gaza, it has to be done in a way with less civilian life uh, being lost. I think that's important to members of Congress. I know that's important to this administration. 
and they're going to speak more about that. Now. I, I think you will clearly hear the president. My guess is that mm -hmm. based upon what the president said last week, that you're going to hear the president continue to stand up for a campaign that defeats Hamas, yes. but is done in a way that is much more respectful of civilian life. I'm going to ask you about the president. Um, as you know, he has mixed up the names of the French and German leaders. He referred to Egypt as Mexico. Adam Smith, who is the ranking Democrat in the House Armed Services Committee, said on Friday, um, Biden does not have the normal strength to go out there and campaign. I think we have the soundbite. He does not have the normal strength to go out there and campaign, you know, to do rally after rally and conversation after conversation. I'd rather have someone who's good at the job and not great at the campaigning than the other way around. But it's going to be a challenge yeah. to go out there and win that campaign. Do you agree with him? I don't. I mean, Joe Biden's the only person who's beaten Donald Trump. And there is absolutely a corollary between being good at the job and being good at explaining to the American people why you should be reelected. Listen, I'm somebody that's worked intimately with the president, right? I worked with him on the bipartisan gun bill. He was involved in every step of that process, not only constructing the bill, but winning individual Republican votes. It would not have passed if not for Joe Biden. And what has happened since we passed that bill? A 12 percent reduction in urban homicides in this country. There are literally thousands of people alive in this nation today because Joe Biden Biden is incredibly competent and he's incredibly effective. And but this partisan and this partisan hit job by somebody that is looking for a, a better Democrat we just played by a better. No, I'm talking about the special counsel yeah. who's looking for a better job in the next Trump administration is not going to dissuade Americans who actually see what the real world impact on their lives is of Joe Biden's administration. But you know, there is a difference here that we're talking about. Your fellow Democrat was talking about the ability to go out there and campaign. You just acknowledge a failure to communicate on a very important issue in regard to Palestinian lives. Is there a problem here? There's, there's not a problem. This president is going to be able to sell a record um, that is extraordinary. Um, unemployment at record lows, factory construction booming, crime down, inflation under control. And he is also somebody that has been the only one member of our party who has effectively beaten Donald Trump in a general election. Mm -hmm. So I know that he is ready for this campaign. I have seen how effective he has been up close and personal. And I'm not going to yeah. let my constituents be distracted by a special prosecutor who's trying to gain favor within the MAGA movement. Sarah Murphy. Good to have you Thank here. Thank you. We'll be right back. We're joined now by former CIA Deputy Director Michael Morrell. He's also CBS News Senior National Security Contributor. And Samantha Vinograd, a former top counterterrorism official at the Department of Homeland Security. And she's here as a CBS contributor as well. And we want to note Sam served in the Obama White House and the National Security Council. And although she has left government, she's a senior advisor to the Biden Institute at the University of Delaware. Good to have both of you here. Good to be here. Mike, I want to start with you. Uh, the items that were in uh, President Biden's possession had markings TSSCI classification, top level uh, classification. The House Intelligence Chair has said that Biden and Trump had basically the same level of documents inappropriately in their possession. Um, is that a fair comparison? It's, it's actually difficult to make a comparison for all sorts of reasons. I think what we can say um, is that President Trump had more documents than President Biden, although the difference is not huge. Um, we can say that both of them had confidential, secret, and top secret information. We can say that both of them had what's called restricted handling information, which requires special care because it's a higher sensitivity. Um, I think we can say that that both of them had what's called um, formally restricted data information, which is information about U.S. nuclear weapons. That information for President Biden was dated, quite dated. Mm -hmm. um, back to the 80s, I think. Back to the 1977, 1979. Mm -hmm. um, so both of them had sensitive information. Mm -hmm. And is it Damaging. I mean, that sounds risky, but I mean, Sam, you have exposure to this, and people say, oh, there's overclassification these days. Sure, but let's keep in mind this is not happening in a vacuum. Our partners and our adversaries are watching what was in that special counsel report, and our partners who do share with us valuable intelligence that includes their sources and methods can take assurance in the fact that this president, unlike his predecessor, self reported having this information and advised 
his team to do exactly the same. Now, our adversaries got very unique insights into some endemic and significant vulnerabilities in the executive branch's processes for tracking and storing classified information. And that is why it is incredibly important, in my opinion, that the president announce a new effort to review how classified information is tracked and archived to avoid this happening again. Because it happened with Biden, Trump, and Mike Pence. But you just heard Mike, the president's lawyer say these were just personal mementos in terms of that handwritten letter in regard to Afghanistan. But what does that say? What does that signal to men and women who aren't commander in chief but have to show up to work and would be held to account for having these kind of documents in their possession? You know, I'm not going to pass judgment on on Mr. Hur's decision to prosecute or not prosecute. Right? I I don't have that experience. Um, what I what I can say is that the senior officials in the government have a responsibility, greater responsibility than anybody else, to manage classified classified information properly. Um, because if they don't, it sends a signal to everybody else that maybe you don't need to do that as well. So. Historically, senior officials who have mishandled classified information have been held accountable both by the Department of Justice and when the Department of Justice declines, as they did in this case, they've been held accountable by, by their agencies at very senior levels. Which, in this case, there isn't any... There isn't Lee somebody course. to do that, right? There, There's no one higher than the president. So sure. I think he, he did say that he accepted responsibility, yeah. and I think that the proof in the pudding here is going to be for not overseeing a staff. Yes, and I've I've been involved in transitions, Margaret. I'm not here to defend the president or not defend the president. What I'm here to say is that, as a factual matter, the vice president was not packing boxes. Now that said. Mm -hmm. The president does have a responsibility to ensure that this does not happen again. And that is exactly why I think that he should announce a review of the executive order that cu currently governs mm -hmm. the classification, storage, and declassification of materials. I think that he should announce that he's appointing a senior official to oversee the processes involved. And as the report details, there were significant shortages in the resources available to the office of the vice president to ensure that classified material was treated appropriately. And it is on the president now to show this country that he is taking steps to rectify that situation. There's a there's a um, example that that is close to the president. Um, John Deutsch, when he was the director of CIA, mm -hmm. um, during his entire time as director, was putting classified information on an unclassified laptop. Um, that was connected to the internet, putting that information at, at risk. Um, when that was discovered, there was a, a referral to the Department of Justice. They declined prosecution, just as in this case. It came back to CIA for an administrative review. George Tenet held him accountable. He indefinitely took away his security clearance. In order to send a signal. In order to send a signal to the workforce that everybody's got to take the management of classified information seriously. And I think the president sh does need to send that signal. I think it is difficult to compare John Deutsch with a sitting president, but I agree with you that it is important to send a signal. As an employee at the White House, I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I had, had various ethical obligations and otherwise. And for the men and women at the National Security Council right now, they, they need to understand that their president values classified information as much as they do. And that's why I do think he needs to be on record announcing steps to avoid this happening again. And I have apologized. I think that he did acknowledge that he did ultimately hold the responsibility for there being a mishandling of information when he was vice president. You know, I'd say that he needs to go a little bit further. So I agree 100 percent that we need a new policy for how, how this is done at the end of administrations, 100 percent. I think he needs to go a little bit further in the apology. I think he needs to say, I should not have had this material. I put national security at risk. Um, I apologize to the American people for that. I apologize to the intelligence community, in particular to those CIA officers who put their lives at risk to collect some of it. There was CIA material in here. Um, and it's not going to happen again. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to make sure of that by making changes. Mm -hmm. A more full-throated apology. Um, I think it's important perspective on the merits of the issue itself, putting the politics aside. So I appreciate both of you sharing your experience with us. We'll be back in a moment. For more on the legal cases against former President Donald Trump, we're joined now by CBS News election law contributor David Becker, the founder 
of the Center for Election Innovation and Research. David, good to have you here. It has been a really busy week on the presidential legal front, but it, it started with a really important decision from the D.C. Circuit that a former president does not have immunity from criminal prosecution. Donald Trump says he plans to appeal this to the Supreme Court of the United States. Do you expect them to take this case up? Well, I think it's an almost certainty that he will appeal. The deadline is tomorrow, is Monday. And then I think the Supreme Court is unlikely to take this up. It is a very strong opinion. These are three judges on the D.C. Circuit, often thought of as the second highest court in the land. They are, were appointed by two different presidents of two different parties. And it's a per curiam decision, meaning they're speaking with one voice unanimously. And they very clearly struck down this idea, and it's a somewhat extreme position, that a president of the United States has blanket comprehensive immunity for any criminal acts they might have done. And it's a very, very strong opinion that I think um, a, a large majority of the Supreme Court is going to find compelling. Which will be significant um, yes. for, for them even to say that that's the law of the land here. But Donald Trump has repeatedly argued to his supporters, as you know, that everything he says is rigged. But on this, he says it will hamstring presidents without total immunity. The opposing party can extort and blackmail the president by saying, if you don't give us what we want, we'll indict you for things you did while in office. Is there any truth to that? Well, first of all, they address that in the opinion the D.C. Circuit does, and they applied this balancing test, and they really thought that the executive branch as a whole, not a particular president, but the executive branch and the public have a right to expect accountability from the president. But then even more so, it, it kind of indic indicates a, a lack of understanding about how the justice system works, particularly in the criminal context. In all of these cases that Trump is facing, whether they're federal, like in Florida or in D.C., or whether they're state-based, like in New York and in, uh, in Georgia, these were grand juries that were convened. Prosecutors had to present evidence before a grand jury of citizens, and they returned these indictments in each of these cases. And then even after that, the prosecutors face a very heavy burden, beyond a reasonable doubt, of proving to a jury of his peers that he committed these acts. Can you imagine how prosecutors have, have a weight on them when that happens? This is an independent investigation. There is no interference from, from the political class on these kinds of things. And they're going to end up having to prove their case before a jury. And you can imagine what would happen if a jury exonerates President Trump in any of these cases and how that might be a political windfall for him. You've just done a very good job of explaining the, the, how the system works. But for those who are only hearing the political slogans, what they see is that Joe Biden is not being prosecuted by the Justice Department for classified, mishandling classified information. Mike Pence wasn't either. But Donald Trump is specifically because he also went to efforts to not hand the, over those documents That's to right. law enforcement when they asked for them to be returned. For those who see this as unequal justice, like, how do you respond? Well, I think this week was a really good indication of how the Justice Department acts as independently as it does. We heard earlier that clearly the Biden administration is not happy with the release of the her report mm -hmm. on, on the investigation. And if they really had as much power over the Justice Department as former President Trump alleges, that wouldn't have been released. It clearly was. Mm -hmm. Also, I think, ironically, we have to note that one of the four charges against former President Trump in D.C. is interference with the Justice Department. He was alleged to have interfered with the Justice Department to try to get them to investigate an election where everyone agreed there was no fraud and, the, and it was legitimate. And so I think it, again, represents kind of the politicization of this idea that anything that happens against the other side is good, anything that happens against our side is bad. But here we see both President Biden and former Vice President Pence were treated very similarly. And former President Trump was treated differently, mainly because he withheld those documents mm -hmm. even when they, he was requested to, and he did not open his doors to the investigators to take a look at them. And you can read the indictments to see the details of specifically the lengths he went there. But uh, in the, you were in the courtroom at the Supreme Court yeah. this week as they were debating this case that came out of Colorado in regard to the 14th Amendment and keeping Trump off the ballot because of alleged role in insurrection. The impression seems to be the justices will rule against the state of Colorado. Is that what you walked away with? I think that's likely to be the case, and it could even be unanimous. I think what we saw, it was, it was such an illuminating argument. The nine justices were really having an, a discussion amongst themselves. Um, and what they all seemed to be troubled by was the idea that a single state 
could make a ruling on this, even after an evidentiary hearing as Colorado had, and that they could basically set the qualifications of a president, just one state for all 50, or that multiple states could come up with different ideas of qualifications. Mm -hmm. And for the presidency in particular, it's the, it's the most unusual election we have. It's the only one that has yeah. electors and electoral votes. So I think it's likely the court's going to rule that he can remain on the ballot. All right, David Becker, always great to have you. Thanks, Margaret. We'll be right back. Super Bowl 58 kicks off tonight right here on CBS. And earlier, we got a preview from host of the NFL Today and CBS News special correspondent, James Brown. You are covering your 12th Super Bowl, as I understand it. And you're right there in Vegas. The league was hesitant about putting a team in that city. Why? And, and how does it change things? Well, quite clearly and succinctly, it is the gambling capital of the world. And the league has worked diligently, assiduously to maintain the integrity of the game with no influence that way. The Supreme Court has made gambling legal. It has always been a part of the game, but the league has been decidedly focused on keeping it separate. I know you have followed for years the concerns, the very real health concerns related to concussions and injuries. Um, the NFL commissioner, Roger Goodell, said in his press conference, the league has made a lot of progress on lowering injuries, but admitted they still have a lot more work to do. How are they managing that? The old school football game was a tough, brutal game. Defenses did not play. Significant changes since. $1.2 billion by the league and the settlement with the players going towards retired players and their medical needs. $320 million this year. Significant progress in terms of concussion research. Rules on the field. Officials are serious about watching how well the game is played properly. You may get one warning, a second one, and you're out. And I think most significantly, the medical community has the last say if a player is injured on the field and they determine that player to have suffered a concussion. The coaching staff has no say in the matter. The medical staff runs the show and there is concussion protocol that that player has to go through for a week, 10 days, two weeks, whatever it is, until they meet a baseline to allow them to go back into action. So it, that sounds like there's improvement um, one thing you and I have spoken about in the past, and I know you feel passionately about this, was the challenge in regard to diversity in the NFL. The last time I spoke with you, you said the track record was pitiful. Do you think it's improved? Considerably improved. Not enough. And to the credit of the commissioner, Roger Goodell, Troy Vinson, his executive vice president of football operations, they continue to push. There is about a 51% increase in terms of diversity across the league. In the leadership positions, the C-suite positions, we've got more folks of color and women who are running the show there because excellence and success is not unique to one given group of people. And I'm glad to see that that's starting to take place. JB, has that diversity impacted how some of the players feel? I know you'd said in the past it was kind of getting to them. You know what? The players are seeing significant progress. As a matter of fact, right here in Las Vegas, the Raiders have the second female president running the organization. Miss Sandra Douglas Morgan, an African-American, a woman of color, actually biracial. Uh, she's running this organization. Amy Trask was the president for the Raiders a number of years ago. So the Raiders have really set the bar high for a number of other teams. I look at the Denver Broncos. There is a significant number of women who are in the ownership ranks of that organization as well. And then when you look at the assistant coaching ranks, since 2013, there's been a 30 percent increase in the number of assistant coaches who are people of color. So the players are seeing that progress and they're very thankful because many of them will like to go that route in the future as well. Great points, JB, thank you. And you can see JB on the NFL today starting at 2 p.m. CBS's all day coverage of the Super Bowl begins right here on CBS next after a quick break. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching until next week. For Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.